Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, and you would turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Some of this was kind of eking through our adult Sunday school class lesson last Sunday morning, and then it kind of carried over in conversation with Brother Duke, myself, and my father in the corner over there. But I'm going to talk to us today about what defiles a man. What defiles a man. Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 7, 5 through 7, and then 14 through 15 in our reading. I apologize, I did not give scriptures ahead of time. It says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answered and said unto them, <clears throat> Well hath Isaiah, or Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Verse 14, And when he had called the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. <clears throat> so several th- things here just in opening and reading this portion of scriptures. The Pharisees were, well, no stranger to anybody here, Pharisees. The Pharisees were Pharisees doing what Pharisees do. And they were walking through a field and or at a place eating. There was another time where they were picking corn on the Sabbath. How dare them. But they were eating bread with unwashed hands. And right away, their question was, why are they not following the traditions of the elders? As if the traditions of the elders was a great commandment. And... <clears throat> He answered them, and and that's when he referred to Isaiah, and he flat out called them hypocrites. Now, Jesus didn't always open up calling people hypocrites. That wasn't his first line of defense. They walk up to him. He just didn't start off saying, hey, hypocrite. Uh, So we can't justify our flesh wanting to be a little rowdy with some people who are legalistic and just call them hypocrites out the gate. Jesus did it. No, it doesn't work like that. But... He, we read over and over again where he tried to reason with them and tried to give them parables and tried to give them understanding and they refused it to the point where they reached certain places where he finally called them what they were. You're a hypocrite. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts way out yonder somewhere. And they were caught up in their traditions. They followed the feast. They did all the things that God had ordained them to do and then some. They added to. They, they did all the extra stuff. And their need to add to was their need to separate themselves and make themselves holier or greater or more perfect than others. So they tried to exalt themselves by these extra rules, if you will. But listen to what he said in verse 7. How be it in vain. Do they worship me? All of the rituals, all of the hours studying, all of the time spent reading the Torah, reading the law, re- studying all this from a youth up, sitting at the feet of men like Gamal and all these different ones that were teachers and great scholars of the word, all of their life, learning, sitting, repeating, doing, all this, wearing things, uh, doing the tithing, doing the the sacrifices, all this. He said, it's all in vain. Man, that just seems, that just hurt my feelings. You mean I'm doing all this and it don't amount to nothing? Thought I was being obedient. 
But because they were hypocrites, it amounted to nothing. Because though they were going through the motions and they were going through the actions, their heart was checked out somewhere else. wasn't nowhere near God. Verse 14, actually 15. There's nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. Now, we can stress on the word nothing, but the truth is Jesus is focusing in on what they were attacking them with, and that is food. There's no food that going into a man is going to defile him. And the word defile here is important. It means this, to make profane, common, polluted, or unclean. There's no food that you would eat that could make you unclean. And then he goes on to explain why. In verse 16, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him according, uh, concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, are ye so without understanding also? It's like he's, 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 he's really kind of like, I'm not talking in parables this time, fellas. Are you, you still don't get it? Do you not perceive that whatsoever things from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him because it entereth not into his heart? So now there's a separation. Now he's getting a little more serious. First we're talking about food and belly. Now we're talking about the heart. Basically the thing that defiles a man is what gets into his heart. And food ain't going to get to your heart. Not directly. It's got to be broken down and become enzymes and proteins and turn to blood cells and this, that, and the other and all that good stuff. Okay, so, so we can be so over-literal that we miss the whole point. Because it entered not into his heart, but into the belly and goeth out in the drought, purging all meat. So number one, food cannot defile a man because it will pass through the body. Now, the fat of it might lodge up somewhere. <laughs> but the meat, he said, goes out with the drought. And we won't, it's not drought where there's no rain. <laughs> Number two, it doesn't defile the man because it doesn't enter his heart. The heart being the epicenter of a man. The heart being the feelings, the emotions, the center of a man, the soul of a man. But what can enter the heart and what gets into the heart can defile the heart. So what are the doors and the windows to the heart? Most of us know this is more of a reminder than it is anything tonight. But what, what are the entrances to the, the window and the door? What is the point of entry to the heart? Matthew 6 and 22 through 24 says this, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, not unibrow, uni eye. If there... If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, and some of that translates to vision, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So in other words, if your eye is focused in on what's good, and it's a good light coming in, then the whole body's going to be lit up. But if your eye is continually focused on things that are of evil or darkness, then your whole body will be darkness. Because the light that's getting in, that, as you heard me call it, that synthetic light is darkness. And Lucifer will come, Satan will come to you as what? An angel of light. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And so number one, an entrance to the heart is the eyes. The heart that he's speaking of, the one that can be, the way it can be defiled, is through the eyes. Number two, things that are heard. 
Romans 10 and 17. Then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if I can hear the word of God and it causes faith to come in, faith is a matter of the heart. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. And that word, word, is rhema, meaning the spoken word. Not just reading it, but speaking the word by that prophetic utterance, by that faith utterance, or just by speaking. He said you could wash. He's washing the church. She can be sanctified. She can be cleansed by the speaking of the word. The same word that does what? Brings faith. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here is the catch, along with the understanding that if your eye is focused on darkness, then the whole body will become dark. The same, but if it's focused on light, the whole body becomes light. The same is true with the hearing. If hearing the word brings faith, then there must be the opposite that's true. No word means no faith. Let me say it again for all those watching Harper. For those that, <laughs> the, if there's no word, if you're not listening to word, then you're listening to some, something that might be destroying your faith. So if there's no word to bring faith, then the opposite of the word may destroy faith. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the tongue, in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. So if faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word, and life's in my tongue, I'm going to eat what I'm hearing because even if I am speaking, if my tongue is releasing life through the word, it's bringing faith into my ear. What's coming out of me, in this case, is not defiling me. It's strengthening me. It's encouraging me. And David encouraged himself in the Lord. Singing psalms and spiritual hymns and all these things. So not only what comes out of the man can defile the man, but it can also strengthen the man. And you will eat the fruit of the tongue. Luke chapter 6 verse 45 says this, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, was a treasure, it's a collection place of valuables, when it starts collecting evil, evil's got to spill out. When it starts collecting valuables, good things, those things are going to come out. And I'm reminded of all the scriptures given, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It's got to spill out. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And we were talking about this and that, you know, not every time you're joking and you joke with somebody doesn't necessarily mean because of what you're saying you really mean it. Doesn't mean it necessarily is coming out of your heart. But the word is speaks and it's plural as though this is a pattern of speech. So if your heart is dark and it is wicked and it is negative, then there will be a pattern of negativity coming out of your mouth. But if your heart is full of life and full of hope and full of the word, then life will proceed out of the mouth on a regular basis. And this is where we've got to learn to inspect our own fruit. What am I eating? Whatever I'm speaking. And if you're having a negative day, Check your conversation. Because you can swing it to life or to death. Because you're going to eat the fruit of what comes out of your own mouth. If all you can do is find fault, everywhere you look is fault, everybody's got issues and problems, and all you can see in them is they got this problem, they got that problem, and all you're focused on is the fault, 
then you are eating fault. You're eating darkness. You're eating bitterness. And you're spitting it out. And you're just starting this regurgitation process. <laughs> but if you can learn to look at an individual and see what God sees, the good and the bad, and you choose to speak life, I know they're struggling, but they're really good at that. In fact, Jesus did it this way when he hit the book of Revelations and he's preaching to the church. He said, you do this well and you do that real well and you're doing real good over there. There's just one thing you need to work on. And it almost made that one thing seem small compared to everything they were doing that was good. Now we got to the one that was pretty rough. And that's the one we living in, the Laodicean age. He didn't have a whole, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of good to say there. But even with the one where the seat of Satan was sitting, he had good stuff to say. Verse 20, uh, back in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. I wish these pants were loose because I'm losing weight, but I don't think that's the case. <laughs> verse 20, Mark 7, 20 through 23. Wherefore, I'm sorry, where are we at? That's Matthew, I need Mark, I'm sorry. Did I say Matthew, I meant Mark. I'll take the blame. Mark 7, 20, and he said, there we go. That which cometh out of the man, that defiles the man. Next scripture, 21. For from within... Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, proceed adulteries, proceed fornications, proceed murders, keep going, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Defile the man. Mark 7 and 20 in the complete Jewish Bible says, It is what comes out of a person, he went on, that makes him unclean. So what defiles a man? Evil thoughts. He said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery where... And it won't be long that if it gets in here, it's going to happen out. While it's in here, it's a sin against you and God. When it gets out here, now I'm sinning against the man, I'm sinning against the woman, I'm sinning against God, I'm sinning against me. It's a sin in the flesh. Fornications, immoral sexual relations prior to marriage, pornography, idolatry. Check out murders. In 1 John 3, 14 through 18, it says, We for our part know that we have passed from death to life because we keep loving the brothers. The person who fails to keep on loving is still under the power of death. I'm going to read that again. This is a complete Jewish Bible probably words it a little different with hers. The person who fails to keep on loving is still under the power of death. And what was it Jesus took victory from? Death, hell, and the grave. And that's what he's given to us. But if we allow the adversary to get hate in our heart, then we start murdering our brother with our tongue. And what comes out of a man? Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. The way that we have come to know love is through his having laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That means, we like to use that term, prefer your brother. You know, when there's a choice between a steak and a piece of chicken on the grill and we having fellowship night and you and the brother come up at the same time, then you've got eyeball steak. 
it would be love to back up and say, you know what, bro, you have that steak. And then it would just be God. If he said, you know what, I don't even want steak. <laughs> and you, you prefer your brother. Love prefers your brother. You don't just dive in and take what you want. Forget everybody else. Fill your plate with your food and it's packed up like this. And nobody else even got in line yet. And some of y'all smile like you're guilty or something. That's not love. That's lust. Because you want to fill the belly. Mm. If someone has worldly possessions and sees his brother in need, verse 17, I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible, yet closes his heart against him, how can he be loving God? Children, let us love not with words and talk, but with actions and reality. That just says it so much better than King James. Let us love with action and reality. You know, he says one thing, but actions speak louder than words. You can tell me on the phone and text me all day long that you love me. But do you defend me when nobody else is around, especially when I'm not there? Do you defend your brother, or do you take up with everybody else that's attacking your brother? Huh? I got a scripture for you later on that one. Thefts. One of those things that come out of men's a theft. Think about it. The thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. Stealing possessions, stealing attention, stealing honor. Oh, no man anything. Killing hope, killing dreams, killing faith. Destroying marriages, destroying relationships, destroying reputation, destroying unity. That's what the thief does. That's not what we do. That's what the thief does. That's not what God's kids do. We don't destroy each other's faith. That's what the devil does. We don't destroy each other's relationships and put brother against brother. That's not what we do. That's what the devil does. Covetousness. This is extortion, eager for gain, greediness, to defraud a brother for gain. Desiring your brother's gifts, calling, blessings, possessions, jobs, to the point, or careers, to the point that you're willing to defraud him in order to get it. And then it goes on and talks about wickedness, deceit. We know what wickedness is, we know what deceit is. You know what lasciviousness is? Filthy. Just nasty. That's lasciviousness. An evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. In Romans chapter 14, verse 16 through 17, the scripture says, Do not let, complete Jewish Bible. <laughs> Y'all get tired of hearing me say that. Do not let what you know to be good be spoken of as bad. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. Sometimes silence is agreement. You know, me and my brother fought a lot growing up, almost every morning. It was a, ar, 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 on my side of the room, on the right side of the room. One good punch to the gut, and it was over. Except for the one running to the parent, and then it continued. But you let somebody else jump my brother. I can pick on him. He can pick on me, but don't you touch him. That's the way it will be in the church. That's love. We're going to disagree. We're not always going to get along. Our personalities are going to clash. But bless God, you let a sinner, heathen person start talking about my brother. You don't know him. You don't know his motives. In fact, you should let him talk to you and tell you his testimony. That's what should happen. Because love defends. It doesn't destroy. Love defends. Love defends. It wars far, not against. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, shalom, and joy in the Rakh HaKodesh. I just love saying that. The Ruach HaKodesh. I didn't do that last part right. 
James chapter 3, verse 8 through 16. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. What comes out of a man? But if ye have bitter envyings and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. I've had a darkness in my spirit for about two months. And I think I got a release Tuesday night. And I'm thankful. Because I was tired of fighting that dude. Because I was catching my mouth, stopping my ears, wringing my hands. Because I'm the guy who can see the good in people and try to work to get it out and to develop it and polish it and let it go. But all I had in my ears and in my spirit was the bad and the negativity and everything everybody felt and where they were struggling and what their issues were. And I'm tired dealing with it. I'm tired. And, I, and all that's going on in my head. I'm like, don't let it out. So what did I do? I sat right there, and you preached, and you preached. I didn't need to be up here. Because I didn't even want to give it an opportunity to slide out of my mouth. Especially up here. Especially up here. It's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. Romans Chapter 1, how far did we get with that one? We're doing good. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. Good news for y'all is I only have like four scriptures left. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, which is jealousy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, just the term itself. Kind of pins gossip against the wall. Backbiters, which means slanderers, in parentheses there. Backbiters are slanderers. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, braggarts. Inventors of evil things. Think about that. Inventors of evil things. Inventors of evil things. That's like somebody was so guile and bitter in their heart they created something that caused other people to be evil. They reproduced evil by inventing evil things. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I was focusing in on this backbiter thing. 
And it's really not in your Bible too many times. I think twice is where I found it, twice. And, and, and I, was, I, I, I had read the scripture and put this together, and then I was in prayer, and all of a sudden it, the Lord just painted this picture for me. And in this picture, he was reminding me that when we get into Corinthians and we talk about the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and talked about the hair of a woman, her long uncut hair is a covenant between her and God, but she then becomes the glory of the man. And when you break all this down, it literally means that when a woman, when a wife, has a covenant with God with that long hair. She has power with the angels to serve as a rear guard to her husband. She's the rear guard. She's protector because the angels are aligned with her and she's covering his back. Right? So she's covering his back and when the cutting starts and the covenant's broken, then he's weak and so she's weak and then he's weak. His, his back's open for attack. When she gets out of order... The rear guard moves. He's open. So I, I was thinking about this whole backbiter thing, and he took me there, and I thought, man, that's, that's pretty interesting. Because when Lucifer came into the garden, he approached Eve. He didn't approach Adam. He approached Eve. He came up on the rear guard. Hath God said. So when Lucifer was beguiling Eve, he was actually backbiting Adam. You follow me? He was hitting Adam from the back. And so if we're backbiting, who are we mirroring? What are we releasing? We are defiling ourselves by lining up with the character of Satan himself. When we go around accusing our brethren, we've lined up with the guy that goes day and night before the throne accusing our brothers. We ought to be ready to justify, defend, aid, help them get through it, get over it, get past it. Stop wearing your offense on your shoulders. A bad comment, a bad joke, a bad moment. You're in a bad mood. They say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Give grace. You're going to need it. Give grace. If you want to give judgment, it's going to come back to you in the same measure you met it. And do you really want to be the one backbiting God? Because when you attack His church with your mouth, you're attacking His back. Hmm? Yeah, it gets scary, then. You start backbiting the bride. I mean, you start backbiting God, you, you attack His bride individually. That's how He works, individually. How do we get there? Garbage in, garbage out. In uh, Psalm chapter 15, actually, I'm going to hold that one. Listen at 1 Corinthians. I had this for Sunday. I never got to it, so I'm going to bring it out today real fast. I don't know about fast, but I'm going to bring it out. 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 26. The complete Jewish Bible says it this way. While our attractive parts have no need for such treatment, indeed, God has put the body together in such a way that he gives greater dignity to the parts that lack it. He said, beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. Mine's pretty ugly if you really want to add them up, line them up. But he said they're beautiful. So mm, my feet are beautiful. So, and it has nothing to do with how they look. It's what they carry. So that there will be no disagreements within the body, but rather all the parts will be equally concerned for all the others. Equally concerned. Thus, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts share its happiness. 
And then Romans 12, 11 through 16 says, Don't be lazy when hard work is needed. But serve the Lord with spiritual fervor. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in your troubles. And continue steadfastly in prayer, people. I would not have survived these last two months if it had not been my prayer life and my relationship with God. And I had to go another notch and another notch and another notch. And I still don't feel like I did enough. Because there were still a few times where I said, whoop, you said I needed more than I got in. Share what you have with God's people and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. I don't care if it's in the church or out of the church. I don't care if it's your brother, the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, or the director tells you you can't do this and you can't do that. Bless them. That's why you get to make the decisions. That's why you're the director. You get to say who can and can't play and who's going to sing and who ain't going to sing. And somebody ain't going to like it. They better keep their mouth shut and say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, when can I serve? Just let me know. Because if you don't learn, if you can't ever, if you can't ever follow, you will never ever lead. And if you think you're leading, just look behind you. Is anybody there? Anybody going where you're going? Then you're not leading. And if you cannot follow, you will never lead. If you cannot submit, no one's ever going to submit to you. It's not going to happen. That's why he talks about the body being accountable one to another, submitting one to another. There's an accountability from the fivefold ministry to the church saints and the ministry there, but there's also everybody. Sometimes I need Brother James to drop a word in my spirit. He'd done it two or three times. It was great. Needed it. Brother Duke drops something in my lap every once in a while. Dad drops something in my lap. We need each other. It don't care who's, what title's in front of your name. It doesn't matter. That just means I have a different set of responsibilities than you have. But lo and behold, don't any of you get the idea that it's okay for you to go dig a hole and bury your talent there just because your talent gets brushed on, rubbed on, corrected and adjusted. I won't wait touching my talent. I'm going to bury it. We know what happened to the guy who buried his talent. Right? So don't fall for that neither. Iron sharpens iron. Right? If you cannot be sharpened, stop trying to sharpen. All them people hollering. Don't judge me are the most judgmental people I've ever met in my entire life. And they're judging the one they're saying is judging them. Why they're saying don't judge me. I love when people do that. I've never had them really do that to me personally. It's been a long time. But you see it all over Facebook. Don't judge me. Don't you know that one day we're going to sit and judge the angels and judge men on the earth? And he said, why are you going to court? When you have your brothers, bring it to them and let them judge the matter. Don't judge me is not word. Now, if you want to take it in its proper perspective, no, don't condemn me. Huge difference. Don't condemn me. But please judge me. Iron sharpens iron. Look at that. I lost my place. I got so excited about that. Equally concerned for others. Verse 26. Thus, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts share its happiness. 12, 11 through 16. Romans 12, 11 through 16. Don't be lazy when work is needed. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Verse 13. Moving down to verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Ew. That lot road devil. Verse 15, rejoice 
with those who rejoice. There's nothing worse in the kingdom of God than for one to get promoted, and when you scan the crowd, there's somebody going, that should have been me. Who are you mad at? God promoted them. Who are you mad at? God did it. In class, we was talking about God decides who's going to be a king and who's going to be a papa. God decides who's going to be the best preacher on the planet and who's going to be the best janitor. Never seen you. So who are you mad at? If you would learn to rejoice when your brother gets honor, you're only preparing a way for you to receive honor. Because if you sow it, you will reap it. And I know we go through some stuff, you're like, how long is this thing going to last? And when am I ever going to be promoted out of it? Jesus, I've tried to be good. I've tried to be a good boy. But don't get mad while you upset that yours ain't going well and somebody else gets something going on, rejoice. Rejoice. That's what opens the door for you to be able to have your moment. You rejoice. You give rejoicing with rejoicing. And if they're suffering, you get down there and suffer with them. It'll make their suffering shorter, and it'll make their suffering easier. Weep with those who weep. Be sensitive to each other's needs. And then I love this part. Don't think yourselves better than others. Now, I'm going to be straight with you. We're better off than a lot of people. Because some people don't know this truth. And because we're better off than them, or to make us want to go bring them along, but to go with your nose in the air like you better than them if you better than them it's only about a holy ghost and you have to want to order judge that he is I mean, we don't want to leave them where we find them we want to at least give them what we got don't think yourselves better than us but humble make humble people your friends and don't be conceited Make humble people your friends and don't be conceited. It doesn't take long. You get into politics. Church has them too. There's elected officials in the church too. <laughs> it don't take long for enough guys to go around rubbing each other's back and patting each other on the back with the pride says, I finally arrived. Don't you worry, if you have any kind of relationship with God, the needle is on its way to pop the proverbial balloon. <laughs> and what a pop it will be. <laughs> the bigger the head gets, the harder the pop is. So humble yourself and make yourself humble. And let God exalt you in due time. But when he exalts you in due time, don't forget the little people. And they ain't little. Just because you, you're there now, it'll be them next time. But by the grace of God, there would I be. I'm going to wrap up with Psalm 15, 1 through 5. I kind of like chillaxing and teaching. It's kind of fun. There's no pressure. Psalm 15, 1 through 5. CJB. Adonai, who can rest in your tent? It says tabernacle. And booth is the word. Who can rest in your booth? Who can rest in your tabernacle, your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? Those who live a blameless life, who behave uprightly, who speak truth from their hearts, and keep their tongues from slander. Who never do harm to others or seek to discredit their neighbors. Who look with scorn on the vile 
but honor those who fear Adonai, who hold to an oath no matter the cost, who refuse usury when they lend money and refuse a bribe to damage the innocent. Those who do these things will never be moved. Never be moved. There's our, there's our marker. There's our example. Grab that tongue before it gets out of your mouth. My wife said recently several times, the enemy's more scared of us passing on the name of Jesus than he is us helping someone to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Even though it's the spirit in us that cries out now, the Father, it's that stamp of the name that separates you from everything else. You're gonna, he didn't say you was going to be persecuted for his spirit's sake. Two things you're going to be persecuted for, his name and righteousness, which means right living. For in that day, good to be evil and evil to be called good. That's where we are. But the Holy Ghost in receiving is incredible and powerful and wonderful and we need it and everybody's got to have it and we make sure everybody gets it. It really is just one more voice in the earth. It's one more voice amongst many voices. So someone with the Holy Ghost makes the difference is letting the Holy Ghost have you. Because it says the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into all truth. But you know if somebody's guiding, you got to be willing to follow. Or they on a walk by themselves. And sometimes the Holy Ghost will get up and leave us because we ain't following. And so that's why out in the world, we got those that are filled with the Spirit. And they'll let the Holy Ghost lead them so far. But there are some who still reject the name. So the devil's not quite as scared of them. Because he said he would give you authority to tread upon serpents. That authority comes through the name. Because the same word used for power in the name is the word exousia, which means authority. So power, dunamis, gifts, endowments come through the Spirit. But it is the name that gives authority to tread on serpents. They got the spirit, but he ain't that afraid of them because they have no power to tread on them. We have power to tread on them. But make sure you're treading on serpents and not your brother. Right? I didn't hear a lot of amens there. I mean, come on. You the brother. Don't you want the brother not to tread on you? Don't tread on me, bro. with that pink shirt on. <laughs> Let's stand together. We are truly and really as Jesus said truly, truly we're on the precipice of something great because we have been under incredible pressure. Incredible pressure. I've been under incredible pressure. I know if I've been under incredible pressure, you've been under incredible pressure. Mine hit me about the last day of March going into April. And I've been dealing with it since. And I would get relief over, and it'd come back, get relief, and it'd come back. The pressure stayed. Until finally, I believe Tuesday night, we broke through something. Incredible intercessory prayer, and we broke through something. When the snot, snot starts flowing, and you don't care where it lands, you're breaking through something. Right? The one night I didn't bring a handkerchief to the prayer meeting, I don't know. It was dripping. Like Mr. Bean. <laughs> don't act like you don't know who he is. When the snot, snot starts flowing, then the Holy Ghost can work with you. And it's a deep cleanse. It's a deep massage. It's a deep healing. It's a deep flow. But I promise you, we 
got here to a new level of mercy with our brother, a new level of mercy with our sister. We got to shut our mouth. I, we got to learn to pause. Just because it passes through here, don't mean it can pass through here. We got to pause, grab, think, wait. Don't let your feelings defile you. Because after all, who wants to hang around a guy that's got nothing positive to say? What are you doing? You're defiling your territory there. Nobody wants to come near you. You stink. You're unclean. And, and, and by the way, if you're on the receptacle end, the trash can where the dumping's going on, if they dumping on you about somebody else, you can guarantee they dumping to somebody else about you. That's the way the defile works. That's the way the backbiter works. It's a serpent spirit. He started in the garden. By the name of Jesus Christ, it don't belong here. It don't belong here. And I put a curse on the snake right now in Jesus' name. I curse the backbiter in Jesus' name. I curse you with sores on your tongue. In Jesus' name. We're going to learn to guard our mouth. Because COVID's fixing to lift right about summertime. And they're not going to have, they're going to remove restrictions. And we got to be ready to grab and go and get people. We're going to have a season. Do you think God's going to trust us with babies if we devour each other? give newborn babies to cannibals here's a meal not happening so here's our chance to get clean here's our chance to get undefiled and thank God we can repent and start over every morning his mercy is fresh and new every morning his grace is sufficient every day his mercy endureth forever and I need it. Maybe you guys got it all together. I need it. I need all of it. I need the grace. I need the mercy. I need to shut my mouth sometimes. A lot of times. A lot of times it's too much. You gotta shut my mouth. Just because you're a preacher don't give you a license to open your mouth and say what you want. By the way, if you can't talk to a sinner out there, you don't need to be up here. somebody out there you do not need to be up here the fruit is in the pudding <laughs> praise God let's find a place to pray for a few minutes do a search I pray the Lord will move in here like you did Tuesday night and we can just stop it up